So the name again, the name of the program is Pers uh, Perspective and Perception, The Myth of Style. There's my um, website address. I was lucky enough to get my own name. And there's my email address. So when, for instance, if you need to send me an email, tell me that you booked a room at the inn for the spring trip, that's where you would send it to the Olympus 21209 at yahoo.com address. Sometimes it gets a little stuck on the first slide. Okay, so the first slide is basically pretty obvious to, I think most of us in the club, you know, what makes an image outstanding. Um, picking a subject with emotional impact. As Sandy said, I'm a real true believer in the stronger the emotional connection that you have to your subject matter, the higher the quality of the images will be um, because you're gonna bring your own emotions into your camera and basically into your compositions. And so you're gonna hear me say that a lot this evening because I'm a very big proponent of that. Using dynamic and fluid compositions, using balance is very important. Using rhythm in, your, in creating your composition is important. And of course, using the proper lighting is always important. And then what I found in actually more like a neuroscience journal is, because they're now studying the way that people look at art by looking at what parts of the brain you know, light up. So what draws your eyes to certain images, larger elements before smaller ones, lighter before darker, warmer before cooler, things that are sharp instead of blurry, high contrast versus low contrast, oblique lines before straight ones, things that are alive before inanimate things, and elements in perspective, meaning, and I'll show you what that, I mean by that very shortly before flat elements, and then isolated elements, meaning that you strive to make your images as simple as possible, which will help you translate the emotional impact to your viewer. So um, with that, let's first start with the most important thing in my opinion, and that's creating depth in photography. Because what we are trying to do is create a 3D world out of a 2D art form. And one of the best ways of doing that is learning your own tricks and your own ways of creating depth in images. And one way to do that is shown in this example, and I have a few others, of just getting really low down on your subject matter. And this was a field shoot that we did actually on the Eastern Shore probably eight or nine years ago. And I love the silos. I love the fact that that truck was being filled with, with, um, uh, you know, with grain. And by getting low down and shooting out, I was really able to create that vanishing point. And that's another really important thing to remember when you're thinking about creating depth in photography is try to create a vanishing point because um, that's gonna really help your viewer stick with your image and look through it and actually look at it instead of just flipping over to the next image. You know, and here's another example. This is a, an iron bridge up in York, Pennsylvania um, that we found on one of our travels, you know. Um, and again, I'm getting really low down. I love the structure of the bridge. I love the rails. You know, I love the curvature that it takes at the end. There's not really a firm vanishing point, but your eye definitely travels right through this image and it comes out to see those houses, you know, in the background. So again, creating depth is just a really important element in making your images really more interesting to the viewer. And the more interesting they are to the viewer, the longer the viewer is going to stick with them. And this next one here, this is South Baltimore. You know, in South Baltimore, we still have freight trains. I hear their whistles at like two in the morning. Um, that come through our, our city. And these are those tracks. These are the CSX tracks um, in South Baltimore. And again, here I am getting very low down on the subject. It's purposely on the curvature of the track. 
Um, I wanted to keep those lights in the image. I wanted to keep that red railroad building in the, in the image. Um, and again, all I'm really doing here is creating depth um, in the composition because it really has a beautiful vanishing point, you know, in the distance where the tracks just go off into, you know, infinity. So the way that you use those things is things, and here's another example. Here's a natural example of creating depth using just natural elements. This is the Gunpowder River um, taken from one of my favorite vantage points. And again, the river itself is providing its own vanishing point. You know, it starts out with this very cool beginning with, you know, with the rocks and the bluish tone. And then it leads to a much more warmer um, point toward the, toward the end. And it just sort of vanishes, you know, into the woods. And so this image again has a tremendous amount of perspective and has a, a tremendous amount of depth. And images that you are able to create that with are really going to be ultimately much more interesting um, to the viewer. Here's a good example. This was a scene that I came across before the person was in the scene. So I came across this beautiful backdrop with these beautiful, this is in New York City on the east side of Manhattan. Um, so I found this beautiful backdrop. I found the, these, I love the fence lines. I love the lampposts. I love the trees coming in off the right. And that's a deserted Con Edison power plant that's just sitting left to ruin on an island in the East River. I think it's finally been completely knocked down. You never had access to it, so there was no way to get on to that island. But we as photographers sometimes need patience. And what this image needed was a person. It just really cried out for a human element to be added. And if you can notice, there are stairs coming up from the left. And, and you know, even though this was not a busy part of Manhattan, I really was aware of the fact that if I just waited more, no more than five or 10 minutes that someone would come up those stairs. And certainly that's exactly what happened. And I got lucky in that he was wearing all dark clothing. And I started shooting him a few steps before where he is, and then a few steps after. And then I just picked out the one that I liked the best, you know, in, 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 on my computer screen. And I just think he just adds the human element to this otherwise very graphic, you know, scene. And again, it's got a lot of depth and a lot of perspective uh, in the shot. You know, here's another example, another club trip. In fact, we were in New York City. This is in an, a neighborhood in Brooklyn called Dumbo, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. And that's the Brooklyn Bridge in the background. And, you know, I wasn't there to try and duplicate, you know, Margaret Bork White's phenomenal work of the Brooklyn Bridge or really anyone else's. I was just really trying to draw your eye using these leading lines and using the depth and perspective of the trolley tracks and the sidewalk with the snow and the ice and the warehouse to just draw your eye right into the scene. Um, so you can see one of the arches, you know, of the Brooklyn Bridge, as well as the office buildings, you know, that are in the background. So again, these are all how you use um, the perspective that you create to alter the perception to the viewer of, of the image. And here's a nat another natural example. Um, I think this was taken on our last trip to Davis in the fall. And I noticed this one single rock you know, sitting in the river. And by including that rock in this scene, it adds so much perspective and so much interest to what otherwise would just be a very peaceful, nice, quiet, you know, black and white river scene. But your eye is first kind of glued to that rock. And then you sort of follow it, you know, out through the banks of the river down into the vanishing point, which is where it takes a curve into the mountains. And so again, it doesn't have to be man-made 
perspective. It can be using natural objects to create depth and perspective, you know, in your images. But it's, it's to me, it's probably, you know, portraits would be an example where you wouldn't be looking for that, for, for an example. But in a lot of other photography and a lot of other photography you're going to see from me tonight, you're going to see me using that uh, creation of depth and, and perspective to alter the perception of the image to, uh, to the viewer. The other thing to play with is scale. Um, you know, because anything that gets a, a viewer to think about what they're looking at, that's about 80% of the battle. And so by looking at this image, you really have no idea how big the piece of driftwood is. You have no idea how big the piece of sandstone is that it's sitting on a rock, that, that are, you know, the size of the rock. I think I took this on a workshop that I was on with Brenda Tharp. Um, and so scale is another thing to sort of play with because I like playing with people's minds. And um, the more you play with your viewers' minds, the more you get them to think about what they're actually looking at. You, as I said, that's like 80% of, of the battle. And here's another example. Um, walking on a beach, people were waiting for the sun to go down. I was like, hey, I'm not gonna waste any time just sitting. I just took a walk and, you know, looked always, you know, the common thing is look up, look sideways, look down. That's all very true. And this is a perfect example of that. I looked down and I just saw this perfect weed just growing out of the sand. But you, again, you have no real conception of how large that weed is, how large the beach is that I'm walking on. And so I'm basically using scale to sort of play with your mind in terms of getting you to think about um, what it is that you're looking at. So scale is another really important building block of putting together really interesting and thought provoking images. And here I am using scale by laying flat on my back and shooting up at these grain silos. And this was on that same trip that we took to the Eastern shore. Um, and what I'm doing again is playing with your mind because when I saw this on the computer screen afterwards, I mean, to me, these more, they look more like rocket silos than they do grain silos. Um, and the way that I was able to create that effect was to use perspective, was to get flat on the ground and shoot straight up, you know, at these beautifully, you know, created um, grain. And these are all just grain silos um, that, um, we're just holding all the grain, waiting for the trucks to come by to, uh, to pick it up. So here's a good, that's a good example of, of using um, scale to get your viewer to sort of think about what you're creating. You know, here's an example of scale that comes from my own backyard. Um, when we used to get big snows, which we haven't gotten in many years, I was out shoveling once and I saw this scene in my backyard. Um, and I said, well, as soon as I'm done shoveling, I'm gonna come back out and take a picture, um, take some images of, of this. And um, it, the interpretations that I've gotten of this image from different people in different clubs have run the gamut. You know, Some people nailed it right off the top. They said, oh, that's just snow like in the crotch of a tree which is exactly what it is. It's just snow that's piled up in the crotch of our triple trunk ash tree. But it also could be a canyon. It could be any number of things. And again, what I'm playing with is scale. And what I'm playing with is your mind. I'm, I'm getting you as the viewer to sort of think about what it is that you're looking at and making it not so obvious. Um, Another really important thing in photography is rhythm. And I don't know whether any of you have ever had the opportunity of having a conversation with Tony Sweet, who used to be a professional jazz musician, and his thoughts about photography's ties to music. Um, 
it was very eye-opening to me. Um, I've heard other people talk about it, but Tony explained it in a way that I had never heard it really explained before. And having rhythm in your images, in many of your images, is really another important building block. This is an apple orchard that's now gone, which is the other beauty of photography, because you never know when something's just going to disappear. These were apple orchards right outside of Stewartstown, Pennsylvania, where I lived for many years before I, you know, moved down to Baltimore full time. And I'm just on a hillside. So again, the vantage point is very important. And I'm just looking down at these budding apple trees. And, you know, it just, it, the way the trees are spread through the field and the way that they're interacting with each other, they really have a nice sense of rhythm to them. I mean, you know, images actually sort of have a beat um, that you can actually almost, you know, have a metronome time to um, when you really do it right, when you really get the rhythm correctly. You know, here's another image. This was actually taken out of a botanical garden outside of Sarasota. This is a huge mangrove tree. And there was no way I was going to capture the entire tree. And so what really captivated me was the beat and the rhythm of what was going on toward the bottom of the tree. Uh, the way these massive curved roots ended up in these tendrils in the foreground. And so this is another image that has sort of a good natural beat, you know, to it. It's really, you know, the rhythm and the beat of an image depends on the spacing between the elements, how certain elements touch each other, how certain elements don't touch each other. I don't really have a definition or a, 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 a method to give you. It's something that you either see when you look through your viewfinder and you feel or you just don't. And it's just something to be aware of when you're composing images is look for uh, the natural rhythm in the image. If it is such an image, not every image has all these building blocks in them. The perfect images combine all of these building blocks into one and then you have a real winner um, on your hands. So I grew up in New York, so I drove, you know, I rode the subways a lot. I went to high school in Manhattan, so I took a bus and two subway trains from Queens to get to uh, high school every day. But this was not taken back then. This was taken probably on a trip to New York eight or nine years ago. And I've seen a lot of subway pictures, right? People lounging across the way, sleeping, leaning on each other, you know, the usual things, you know, a homeless person. But I was leaning up against the door and I looked up and I saw these hands. And again, what struck me right away was the natural rhythm this image has the major hand on the right hand side and the, the other three sort of fading away into the distance and the poles um, create a structure to the image. And it just has, to me, it just has not only a feel of a New York subway train and as a New Yorker, that's really meaningful to me, but it actually has a really cool beat and a really cool rhythm uh, to it. And it's also the only shot that I've ever seen taken in a New York subway train that looks anything like this. So I was very happy to capture a very unique view, uh, you know, within the subway system. So pre-COVID, we have, and we will still have, roller derby in Baltimore, and it's women's roller derby. And it's not quite the same roller derby that I used to watch on TV in New York when I was a kid. It's not quite that rough, but it's still a contact sport. And you can tell from the pads that these women are wearing. And all I was trying to do on this shot, this was a very challenging environment to get good images. And I got some good individual portrait shots of the, of the skaters, but what I was really looking for in this image is to show the rhythm and the motion. 
And I also really wanted to get that referee in the background with the striped shirt who's standing totally still. And he's the gentleman that's calling all the fouls and all the penalties. And the colors in this, in the inside roller rink, based on the fluorescent lighting and everything, really just didn't work. And so this worked much more as a, as a black and white. And I just love the way some of the skates are actually moving and some of the skates are, are stock still. And again, it just has, based on a motion sport, it just has such a nice natural, you know, rhythm to it as these two teams um, basically really go after each other. And, you know, when it comes back, I would strongly suggest uh, going out to the rink in Dundalk um, on a Saturday night to watch the women play um, roller derby. It's really a lot of fun. So sometimes we can combine rhythm with balanced composition. And that's what I'm trying to do here. These are just branches that are sticking out of the snow, but I very carefully composed this image because I wanted to start combining those elements of having a nice rhythm to the image, which I think this does. I like the way the smaller branches on the left echo the larger branches on the right. I like the ones in the middle, they sort of complete the scene. And overall, it kind of creates a really nice balanced, you know, composition. And I love the way the snow came out in terms of the moguls. It looks like they're, you know, the moguls that the skiers are skiing on in the Olympics. And, you know, this was just in my backyard, um, you know, after one of our bigger um, snowfalls. So again, this is when you can start combining these elements to form really more interesting images. So here's an example of something that I saw on my way down to the Gunpowder River. But this example, because I have another one to show you in a second, is completely off balance. It's not a balanced composition at all. It, you know, it's dominated by the major hay bale it's got the two hay bales in the distance and it's got a great sky, but compare this image to this one. And there's no comparison. By including that other hay bale and the tree, I've created a triangle. And even though the lines are not drawn onto the field, your mind completes the scene you know, the line from this hay bale to this guy right here to the tree next to it, and then to the bale in the background, and then right back to the hay bale. And so you kind of stay within that triangle. And then I was just blessed with really having a nice gorgeous sky uh, the day that I took this. So this is another example. It has a nice rhythm. It has a nice feel. It's balanced. Um, and it just makes for a really interesting image. And again, this was in my phase where I was beginning to do more and more conversions um, to black and white. And that really came out of my interactions with people at the club because I hadn't shot or converted, you know, done any black and white work in, in years and years and years. And now I find myself doing more black and white than I do uh, color. So this natural formation has a beautiful natural rhythm to it. The wind is picking the sand up. This is in Great Sand Dunes National Monument, which I think is now a national park. Um, this is in southeastern Colorado. Um, and um, I darkened the sky to give it a bit of a night kind of look. I didn't make it jet black. I made it sort of charcoal gray which matched the charcoal gray in these dunes down here. But as you look through the image from right to left, it just has a really nice rhythm to it, the way the dunes are laid out in front of you. And then the sand being blown was like an extra added feature um, to the image. So again, just a real combining of all of these building blocks to make images more interesting and more um, fascinating and thought provoking, you know, to your viewer, because that's what it's really all about and to yourself too. 
balanced composition. I'm just sitting at the edge of a pier on a pond in Maine, and I look down and I see these leaves just in this perfect formation. Um, I didn't touch this. I didn't, you know, make, I didn't move any of these leaves. They were just balanced for me. Um, you could see how clear the water is because you can see the bottom. You can see the sand on the bottom. I also love those two sticks that kind of bisect the image. They don't really break it into thirds or halves, but I kind of like the, the augment that they give the image. But the way that the leaves are just splayed out in a very natural way just makes this for a really nice, balanced, you know, simple late fall, um, you know, composition. Uh, this one was actually taken pretty recently because we did get a little snow in the fall, uh, if you remember, like late November, early December. And as soon as it snows, I basically, I'm up 83 and I'm driving back up to Southern York County where I used to live because I know where these farms are um, because I'm used to shooting them. Um, and instead of just showing the fences this time, I wanted to shoot the horses. Now, when I first was composing the image, this horse on the left was not there. And if you can imagine this image without that horse, it was very imbalanced. It was very right heavy. There was too much going on on the right. And there wasn't something that was filling in that gap on the left. Now there were horses over there. So I knew it was just a matter of time before someone so one of those horses would come over and sure enough, within a few minutes, that one horse came over, stuck his nuzzle in the snow, looking for some grass, picked his head up, popped the shutter, and now it's a balanced composition because that horse on the left is so critical to the overall composition of the image because um, it filled in a gap that really left it looking very unbalanced. So sometimes just be patient and you may see something that may be not 100% complete, but if you just wait a few minutes, what you need to make the image complete may just sort of appear. And in this case, that's exactly sort of what happened. Um, and, you know, I, this is definitely one of my favorite, I'm not a big horse guy, but this is definitely one of the favorite images that I've taken of you know, of horses um, on a farm. You know, this barn the year before, this is in West Virginia on a club trip. This barn the year before was in terrible shape. It was falling down, the paint was all peeling. And that year I concentrated along with, I know Jim Vogline and a few other people, on the barn itself, the textures of the barn, because it was in such bad shape. And when we came back the next year, at first we were sort of horrified because the barn had been completely cleaned up and painted and freshened up. And so I knew I had to take a totally different approach um, because shooting just the barn as a white barn was not gonna be nearly as interesting. And so I moved further back and put a wider angle lens on and then I began to see the image come into place. I began to see the way the clouds were being reflected in the water. I began to see the, 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 the torso shape of the, of the mountains and, it, and the reflections in, in, the, in the water. And so all of a sudden it became, it, it came together. You know, it took a little work because at first I, we were kind of bummed that the barn had been cleaned up, but then it became, you know, one of the images that I'm really most proud of in that it really took some work to figure out the right way to compose this so that it came out as a complete balanced and really nicely rhythmic, you know, image. Um, so, you know, again, with photography, I know with digital, it's so easy. We're so used to just pop, 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 pop and moving on to the next spot. But you know, take your time, slow yourself down, you know, use whatever mindful exercises you can create yourself and spend more time on creating interesting compositions because they'll pay off in spades 
um, you know, after you actually look at your work, um, when you come back, you know, from like a trip like this. Uh, so this is the Amtrak station, which again, pre-COVID, I used to visit on a pretty regular basis because I was getting really interesting images um, at the Amtrak station. And this again is just a good example of a balanced composition. I saw this gentleman sitting on the bench. Yes, he's looking at his phone. That's just what we have to deal with these days. This is all still pre-COVID. But I was able to keep the architectural details in, the sconce on the right-hand side, that stained glass sign, offices. And I have him just centered, you know, in the composition. That mat on the floor is almost like a leading line that leads you to that really nice shadow of light. And that leads you right to the gentleman on the bench. So it's just a really nice, balanced, simple, composition where all the elements are working together and there are lines, implicit lines between all of these elements. There are lines between the sconce on the outside and the light on the inside. You know, so our brains have the capability of filling in information that is not immediately apparent, but is definitely there if you compose your images carefully and with care and with some time um, instead of being in you know, such a rush. This is probably the only decent picture I ever got at Gettysburg Battlefield. And that has a lot to do with the fact that most Civil War battlefields are full of well-deserved monuments and signs because they're, they're historic places. But I was always frustrated with the images that I would come out with because I just there was just too much stuff in them. And so on one of our trips, what caught my eye originally was this picket fence. I just loved this picket fence. So I set the anchor as this post right here. And then your eye naturally follows the picket fence it then goes right to this dark shrubbery over here. It then travels up to the tree line, which you then follow. You have a nice barn right there. You keep following the tree line. Yes, there's one monument of a gentleman on a horse right there. Then your eye goes to the other dark shrubbery, which leads to this part. And that takes you right back to the center of the image. So. This is a really nice balanced, you know, composition that has a lot of elements that are all sort of working together to form a whole. And that's really, you know, that's been my goal now for a while to try and create images that have a numerous amount of elements that I spoke about earlier that all sort of work together to form an entirety, an entity, if you will. So speaking about perspective, and this one was also taken very recently, um, we've all seen pictures of waterfalls, um, the silky water effect, and you know, the ones at Watkins Glen, and you know, and I love all those pictures, and some of them are absolutely stunning. But Gordon and I were out one day in somewhere in northern Baltimore County, and we were driving down a, a little side road and came across a waterfall that actually was just right off the road. And it, it gave me an opportunity to literally sit down right over here. And instead of shooting the waterfall in my typical way, it gave me the opportunity for a very unique perspective um, on shooting the top of the falls. It's a very small waterfall. It's probably no more than 30 feet wide. Um, but I love the abstract shapes that I was getting, and I love the abstractions of the trees, which are right up here, and they're reflecting in the, in the, uh, in the top of the waterfall. So again, this is just using a unique kind of vantage point to come away with an image of something that we all love to take pictures of, but this is kind of different from any other waterfall picture that I've ever taken um, before. 
And, you know, if we get a hard freeze, I'd be tempted, I'll probably go back and see what else, you know, I can create um, from this. It is trespassing a little bit, but I don't think the guy that owns the property um, really minds because I think he saw us and I, he didn't pay any attention to us. You know, he, he knew that we were just taking pictures of the waterfall, so. I also like playing with abstraction. Um, I don't consider myself an abstract photographer. I think that's a skill in itself, but I got, I made this image at the Oculus, which is the transit center, um, which replaced the subway station at the World Trade Center after the 9-11 disaster. And I'm walking through the bill. It's a beautiful piece of architecture that's, you could spend all day there photographing. Um, but I looked up and I just saw the reflections in the glass, which I really liked. I love these two arrows that were pointing against each other. I love the steel steam pipe that's running through it. And it just, to me, it just struck me as a really interesting, you know, abstract, you know, image. Um, all the pieces, again, they sort of work with each other they're sort of working in concert with each other to form a nice whole you know entity here's a different vantage point in the oculus now this time i'm looking down on the floor of the transit station and there's a, it's not just a subway station there are a lot of other trains that come through here and it's got these beautiful skylights that throw these amazing lights and shadows onto the floor. But I also wanted to capture a picture that had humanity uh, involved in all their various tasks. And I also wanted to show the architecture of the ribs of the building, of how it actually was constructed. It's really, really a fascinating building. And it's right next door to the 9-11 Museum, which is very much worth visiting, um, you know, next time you're in New York and in, in Lower Manhattan. So again, it's sort of abstract. It's not abstract. It's sort of, um, you know, it's sort of a, 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 a tourist picture in a way, but in a way it's not. It just, it just crosses a lot of different lines. But once I saw the beauty of this skyline of these uh, of the skylight and what it was creating you know then i had to hone in a little further and now i'm using my vantage point to just shoot like straight down and i think you can even see these two guys i think they're these guys right there so i just moved to a different vantage point and shot straight down at these two gentlemen just having a cup of coffee and chatting. And I love the shadows. They look like Alfred Hitchcock shadows to me. Um, so this was, again, just another way of showing um, the humanity aspect of, uh, of, this, of this piece of architecture. Then at the same time, I was able to create, not create, but capture these beautiful light shadow um, details in this building. It's really an incredible building. Uh, another great place to find interesting perspective and interesting shots is what's called the High Line. I know a lot of us have walked the High Line. For those of you who don't know, the High Line was an elevated Manhattan subway line and freight line that became deserted and unused. And instead of just tearing it down, the city and some benefactors invested a lot of money and turned it into a walking park. And it's absolutely, I think now, one of the highlights of Manhattan because you're about three or four stories above the ground when you're walking the High Line, which now has been extended. So it's now about a two and a quarter mile walk. And all this is, is this is just reflections of the building across the way from where I'm shooting. And I'm just getting this very unique warped sort of perspective, you know, of the, um, I think it's a residence actually. I don't think it's an office building. I think it's actually apartments. Um, so I highly recommend getting, getting to the High Line because you can really get very interesting images, you know, from it. Um, now, in that general area, 
which is now called Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards was one of the last sort of undeveloped tracts of land in Manhattan left, basically, that hadn't been built up. And so some developer, although it's nowhere near a subway line, so it's not really a very convenient place to live, some developer bought the property and built apartment buildings and office buildings and a mall. And then I guess he hired an architect and they built this structure, which I personally can't stand. It's called the vessel. And you can actually pay a couple of bucks and you can walk all the way up to the top of the vessel. It's about seven stories high. I don't really think it, well, I don't even like the Hudson Yards area in general. I don't think it's really a very attractive area. But since I was there, I said, well, you know, I got to take a picture of the vessel. It'll make a cool black and white. I purposely left some people to give it some perspective. But then since I really wasn't satisfied, I went inside the mall, which I knew had glass walls because I could see that. And so from that came this. And I liked this so much more because this added another element, a very important element, a human element to what I perceived as somewhat of an ugly piece of architecture. So I was just leaning up against the wall, watching people walk by. And as they walked by, some would stop and look at this building outside. And this was the one that I liked the best because of her position. I liked the way her legs are sort of crossed. I liked the way her arms are outstretched. And she's just looking straight out the window you know, at the vessel. And I'm able to keep her in silhouette. And I'm getting a nice shadow of her down here. And so I, you know, you know, I, Susan was doing some shopping and I said, well, this is where I'm going to be. And I, I just leaned up against that wall for like an hour and I just shot people as they walked through, you know, the reflection of the vessel through the uh, through the glass wall. Again, Highline, you can't get these kind of shots any place else in Manhattan. This is the space in between two office buildings. But to me, as I looked at this image, it has so much geometry and so much rhythm and so much uh, movement to it for static objects that it just was blowing my mind. Um, and I just, I love the gate, which sort of bisects one half from the other half. Um, the way the interior of this lobby area is sort of lit. Um, I love the two walls that are kind of forming a tunnel uh, in between these two buildings. And you really can only get these views from very unique vantage points like the High Line. So these are the kind of images you can get when, you're, when your perspective changes. Because when your perspective changes, the perception of the images that you're creating is going to change in the people that are viewing your work. And I really, I just really still enjoy this image today because it's got so much detail going for it. And although it's completely static, it has so much movement in it between all of the different elements and the way your eye sort of just travels through, you know, the image. So changing kind of completely where I am, this was on a trip in Paris, but I'm, I put this in because of perspective. I'm in my hotel room and I'm looking across the way and all I see is this hand holding a cigarette and a watch. And I purposely left in these part of the louvers because I think that gives it a little feel for Paris. And it's just the simplest composition. And yet I just love it. It just, it's just, it again, it has, there's a certain rhythm and a certain grace and a certain dignity to this shot. And all it is, is a hand holding a cigarette where you can kind of also see the watch. And I, as I said, I included a little piece of the louver to give it a little feel for people that have been to Paris, they kind of know that this is probably taken in 
you know, in Paris. Um, you couldn't, I really couldn't make out the person. The person was in the room and the shadows were just far too deep for me to see the person, but I wasn't really interested anyway. I was really interested in, in the hand because um, that's what I saw when I looked out my window um, and that's how I captured this image. You know, vantage point again, I'm still in that Hudson Yards area, but I'm in a different part of it. And I'm looking down at the entrance to an office building and I'm seeing these gorgeous wavy line reflections uh, being reflected in the glass. And I'm seeing these great lines on the uh, cement coming in. And those wavy lines are picked up again on the tops of the porticos. And then I purposely wanted to get a couple of people in the shot to give it its humanity. And so this gentleman has already come in and this woman is going through these revolving doors and this gentleman is about to come in through these revolving doors. And I purposely shot this at an odd sort of an oblique angle because I thought shooting this straight on, it would tend to be too static and I didn't want it to be static. I wanted it to give you that sense of movement which I think the combination of the wavy lines and the architecture and the people help give it, you know, that feeling. Um, so vantage point is really critical. It's, it, it's, it sounds so simple in terms of, well, yeah, your vantage point, where you are when you take the picture, but it, there's more to it than that because finding the vantage point for the right composition for the scene that's in front of you can be time consuming because you may look through your viewfinder the first five, six, seven, eight times and still not be pleased with the image that you're seeing. And maybe it's the ninth time when you've moved two more steps to the right that you finally say, ah, that's what I had in my mind, right? So that's what I wanted to shoot. So it sounds simple to, to find the right vantage point, but in a lot of cases, it's anything but simple. So moving subject matter, we'll talk now about trees. And a lot of us love shooting trees. And I love using this one as my opening example. This was after a snow and ice storm that we had. And as I said, I immediately got into my car. And as soon as I knew it was safe, I drove up 83 to um, right outside of Stewartstown, Pennsylvania to the countryside in which I lived and raised my daughter. And you could tell that there had been an ice storm because you could see the way these trees are coated. And when I drove by these trees, I, you know, I skidded to a stop because to me, these trees are dancing with each other. They're wearing skirts, they're wearing blouses, they're wearing jewelry. And the way that they're connected, even though they're technically not connected, made it look like they were actually dancing with each other. And, you know, that's just a unique opportunity to create an image. Um, the tree on the right is now gone. It's laying on the ground. So you never know when an image you take will be gone a moment later, a week later, a year later, five years later. You just never know. But this was a must have, I mean, as far as I was concerned, because I knew that I would probably never see a scene like this ever again. Um, and again, color wise, it just worked so much better as a, as a black and white than as a color uh, frame, even though this one was probably taken a good seven, eight, nine years ago. So I like shooting trees. I know, I know a lot of us like shooting them. I like shooting them in the winter more than in the spring and summer. I'm not so crazy about them once they leaf out. I like seeing the skeletons and the bones of a tree, which you've got to see in the winter. Um, you know, just about a week ago, we had a late afternoon fog roll in, just sort of out of nowhere. It had been sort of a misty day, but I looked out my living room window and all of a sudden, you know, it was incredibly foggy out. And I knew that I could quickly get to an area where there was a stand of trees with no man-made objects. But the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to look at this and absorb it 
And then look at this. Two completely different perspectives on the same trees. You can try and get the length and breadth of the trees in your image. I couldn't get the entire length of breadth, even with a wide angle lens. The bottoms are cut off and the tops are cut off, but I still like the way it looks. But then I started playing more with the cross sections. And actually, I enjoy doing the cross sections more than trying to capture the whole tree. Because I think from a perspective point of view, this creates a far more thought provoking kind of image than trying to capture the whole tree. And so what I began to look for were these strands of ivy that were running up some of the trees. And I looked for ones where some of them were dark and some of them were gray and you could see how foggy it was in the background. Um, so again, it seems so simple, but always remember to look vertically as well as horizontally at whatever you might be composing because you never know which one may give you what you think is the better quality image. In this case, I really like these horizontal cross sections better than the verticals. I just think they say more to the viewer and I think they express more you know, to the viewer of what was actually happening you know, at the scene. And then I still, Although I was happy with these images because the fog was really cool, I still didn't get the image that I kind of saw in my brain until I headed home and I came across this. And this was sort of what I was looking for, which was a tree in the foreground that was darker and then other trees in the background that just get completely washed out in the fog there's a really nice rhythm between that tree in the front and the tree behind it. They're almost having sort of a conversation with each other. And this was the image that I came back happiest with. Um, and I probably only shot maybe 30 or 40 frames total before it got dark. It just, you know, it, it didn't happen until like four, four o'clock in the afternoon. So it all, it all had to happen real fast. Um, but I was really pleased with the way this one um, came out. You know, I'm also a big fan of Japanese woodcut um, artwork. And so sometimes I shoot trees in that style. And I think what I'm already trying to show you is that I don't have any one style of photography. This is a way of shooting trees. Um, that give you that Japanese woodcut kind of look. They're very sharp lines, very distinct. The key to these images is to have nothing man-made in them at all. No cars, no houses, no people, just the trees themselves. And it's hard to find these kinds of scenes, you know, within the city confines. I guess you could find them in some of our parks, but in you know, off of 83 in Southern New York County, you can find these kinds of scenes a lot. And I actually shot this with a long lens um, at the edge of a field. I saw this tree stand in the distance and put it my, you know, put my camera on a tripod and put my 300 millimeter on. And I actually shot this from quite a long distance, but was really pleased with the way it came out because it really, does have that Japanese woodcut kind of look to me. And I really, that's what I was sort of going for in, in the, uh, the post-processing, uh, in the digital darkroom, as we say. Here's another example, not so much a Japanese woodcut, but sort of, um, I don't really know what style to call this, but I just love this stand of young trees that were growing really close to each other. In the digital dark room, I darkened the background. I didn't want to make it black because I wanted you to see some of the details, but I really wanted you to see the minute details in these beautiful young trees that I think someone had planted. I don't think these would actually have grown this way, you know, naturally. And so again, with some sharpening and some texture added, I was able to create another very interesting kind of look 
to a tree stand, which is what I kind of call these when you find a group of, uh, of trees together. And they have sort of an oriental look to them, but not nearly as much as the one that I just showed a second ago. You know, bamboo, we have bamboo throughout Mount Washington. People, they think they're, they silly plant bamboo thinking that it's gonna be sort of a divider between their house and the house next door. And what they lose sight of is how difficult bamboo is to keep uh, in track because it's really an impossible plant to almost get rid of. And, you know, I've walked by this particular stand of bamboo on many occasions. And on this particular day, I did have my camera with me and I just love the way the rhythm of the leaves spread out through the bamboo thicket. And um, again, the key is you can't see anything through the stand. You just see the stand of bamboo. I like the fact that some were on a diagonal, some, some were straight. I like the way the leaves form sort of a natural rhythm through the image. So sometimes just around the corner from your house, you can find really fascinating things to shoot. And this was fun to play with in the digital darkroom as well, um, to tone it and to make it look the way that I saw it in my mind when I created the shot. Um, now, this image is interesting because it actually has two different actions happening. There's only one way this image could, can be duplicated. I was on a hammock underneath these trees while the wind was blowing. So my hammock was being blown back and forth and the trees were being blown. And so I just kept shooting, knowing that every single one of them was gonna be different. And this one just turned out to be my favorite because it shows, I think, the dual action of what's going on because the wind wouldn't be blowing the trees in the way that you're seeing them because it would be more directional but the hammock swinging in combination with the wind enabled me to get these trees in a very unique kind of motion um so i know a lot of us have taken you know these kinds of images looking up at trees but as soon as i saw the hammock outside of this vacation home that we rented i said oh i'm gonna have fun taking pictures of these trees you know, from the hammock, which I did. I just had a blast. I spent like an hour just swinging back and forth and, and taking, um, taking these pictures. So for those of you who know me, I do collect what's called, you know, hand tinted photography. And I took this picture of, I really love this tree. Again, it's one of my favorite solo trees. I love the way the branches are spread. I love the rhythm of the tree. But as I worked on it color-wise, it reminded me so much of a Wallace Nutting or a Fred Thompson. And so then I purposely really tried to emulate the look of a hand-tinted photograph. Um, and the colors come really close to um, what those artists did because those artists would take black and white photos and using pastels and oils and acrylics, they would basically paint in the colors uh, into the imagery. Um, and I have a pretty big you know, collection. I have a bunch on my wall and have a bunch in, you know, in my cedar chest in the basement. It's just something that's easily collectible, not very expensive. And I just always love the look of those hand tinted photographs. And that's what I was kind of going for when I created this um, you know, image in the, uh, in the digital darkroom. Now, this tree is like a friend of mine. Uh, you guys that know me have seen this tree on many occasions. I probably took this image on the same day I took the dancing trees because look at the ice on the branches. Um, I say this tree is a friend of mine because I've been shooting this tree for over 15 years. It's, I know exactly where it is. Um, and 
if you find a place that you like to shoot, you should revisit that place over and over and over again. Not only to look for different vantage points, but to establish your emotional connection to the scene. I mean, this, you know, I really do consider this tree kind of like a friend of mine because when I see this tree after having not seen it for a while, it's like seeing, you know, an old friend. So this was one view of it probably taken that same day um, after that ice storm. But here's the same tree, um, you know, against a really stormy sky after we had just gotten a couple of inches of snow. And I think I took this one again this fall. Um, and again, I'm just, I just love the way this tree looks. I like the way the branches go out to the right. They're balanced by the taller branches to the left. It just is a tree that calls out to me. And sometimes when we're driving around, when you're driving around in rural parts of, of the county or in you know Southern York County, you know, you, every once in a while you see one, you go, oh, wait a minute, that tree really is very interesting. You know, you can pass dozens and dozens of trees that are not really as interesting. But every once in a while, you see one that just grabs you. And what grabs you is, I think, the rhythm of the way the branches are splayed out. And so, you know, I shoot this tree four seasons a year. I go to visit it. Um, it's kind of on my route. It's right on the Maryland Pennsylvania line. And um, it's just great. I just love it. All right, so now we'll switch gears and we'll move into another love of mine, which is the fading industrial base of Baltimore. And um, it's becoming harder and harder to find. This is the old Crown Cork and Seal complex, which is the last large industrial complex left in Baltimore. All the rest of them have been raised, have been knocked down. Um, I came across this sort of by accident. I kind of knew vaguely where it was. And I pulled in and parked and walked. This is with one of the entrances. And I saw this scene in front of me and just almost fell down. It was like, oh my God, look at this amazing scene. And this plant made all the bottle caps for all of the bottles that were basically made in the United States from about 1912 through the 1920s, and then new techniques were developed. Um, and unfortunately, that upside down stop sign has now been removed by someone, which is a shame because when I saw that, I just really, <laughs> that really was a, a great added addendum to the picture. But you can clearly see Crown Cork and Seal work safely today. I've never seen the word today hyphenated. So that was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. And the colors are really not augmented. That's really the colors that were still and are still there right now. Um, so this was sort of the opening scene um, to what I then was able to discover. And by walking through the complex, I was able to discover more and more amazing things. This is a warehouse made out of corrugated metal that is basically just completely falling into disrepair. The brick buildings, they're actually renting out to cottage industries, but there are parts of the complex that are basically just falling into total disrepair. And what really struck me when I saw this scene in front of me was the corrugated metal, the rust stains, this one piece on an angle, which is now gone, unfortunately. Um, and the decision I had to make composition-wise had to do with rhythm. Where do I put the darker spaces, right? Where do I put the guy that's on the angle? You know, this is a huge wall. There's a ton to the left and a ton to the right. It was finding the right vantage point to give me the image that I was looking to create. And this turned out to be the right vantage point. Um, so as I dug a little deeper, you know, Here's a door that probably hasn't been opened in 80 years uh, from the way that it looked to me. I mean, it was actually still locked with a very old padlock, um, but the way that it had rusted out, and you know, it just it you know it just called out to me. Um, so this is again 
showing you a completely different style of my kind of photography because I apply different styles to different types of work that I'm working on. These are what some of the windows look like in some of the abandoned warehouses. And they just fascinated me. They were just amazing. Um, they were like portraits, you know, from the bygone era of the industrial age. So I spent a fair amount of time looking for these really interesting windows. Um, you can see that they're boarded up behind and there's a wire mesh fence between the uh, wood and the glass. Um, so these have been completely sealed up in a way, but these have been left to just sort of ruin. And to me, it, again, these were like portraits that I was shooting. Um, depth wasn't required, perspective wasn't required because it's sort of right in your face. It's right, it's right there. Um, and they made really gorgeous prints too. They really came, came out really well. Um, you know, I could only get this scene by shooting up, but when I looked up at the roof, a part of the roof of the built, one of the buildings, it had this beautiful like glass block, which I just really was enamored by. And I also really liked this yellow pipe coming down. I'm not really sure whether that was to pipe things in or for something to escape out of. But, you know, I, I, did the best I could, meaning that I'm shooting up, so my perspective is skewed, and I didn't even try and really correct it to, to get it right, because I never could get it to the level that it would be straight. So I just accepted it for what it was, and I like, and I still like it, because it just shows another aspect of part of this complex, which is just an amazing place. And these are other some other older industrial things. This actually is in Hamden, right near Clipper Mill. So this is right near my house. And what fascinated me was the stairwell. Uh, you know, um, it's a brick warehouse, but that stairwell is all iron. And it, it just leads your eye, you know, right down to the end, right down here. And the problem was, is that there were always cars and trucks in front of this entranceway because there are businesses in here. And one day I happened to drive by and I said, aha, no cars, no trucks. And I immediately pulled back and across the street where there's a parking lot. And I took my wide angle lens out, took my tripod out, and I was able to get the full sweep of the stairway from top of the roof all the way to the bottom. Um, and also in that same exact area was this building. Um, I'm not sure what it was originally, but this is sort of still what it looks like. You know, this is going to be raised pretty soon, you know, I fear, because this is all very valuable property uh, adjacent to Hamden um, uh, and adjacent to Clipper Mill. And, you know, at some point, you know, some, this building especially will probably just be go the way of the wrecking ball and either townhomes will come up or maybe some office space will come up. So when you find scenes like this, you know, definitely shoot them because they're not gonna be around for a long time. And I purposely came back to this one in broad high sun because I really love these raking shadows that are coming down from the tin roof and from the, uh, from the, 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 the ballast that's holding it up. So I, I saw this, but I said, I'm going to come back in another hour when the light is going to be better. Um, and I was able to get that um, really nice shadow in there. So this is a still scene from The Wire. And if you know me, you know I talk about The Wire a lot. It's definitely, in my opinion, not only the best thing made for television, it might be one of the best things that anyone has ever created for any screen, small or large. I think David Simon is a genius. He's got another one coming out soon. That's all about the gun task trace force. That's going to be a six part miniseries. That's going to be really great. So the first time I watched the whole five seasons of The Wire, I watched it for the storyline because the storyline in The Wire is very dense. There's, a, there's at least 40 main characters in The Wire. And it really takes a while to sort of get sucked into the storyline. 
But the second time I watched all five seasons, I watched it for the cinematography and I watched it for where they were doing the shooting. And I even contacted the set designer or the production designer who happens to live in Fells Point and lives with Pat Moran, who's a very famous casting director. And he actually published a map uh, that appeared, if you remember, in the city paper that actually showed where a lot of the scenes from The Wire were filmed. And so as I began to shoot Baltimore in its inequity, The Wire had a tremendous influence on me. And this was just one still scene that I found, you know, from, um, from one of, from somebody's website that had The Wire. But you can clearly see how I'm borrowing a style, you know, from that shot to this. And when I, this was one of the first ones that I shot when I started driving through East and West Baltimore. And yes, I did it myself. And yes, I got out of the car on many occasions. I was never accosted. I never felt in danger. These were neighborhoods that I would not walk into past dark or after midnight but I didn't feel at all uncomfortable shooting Baltimore during the day. Um, so this began a journey of me discovering Baltimore. Now, this is an example of a throwaway shot to show you a bad perspective. This is Old Town Mall, which is now due to be demolished. So this is a cheap shot. This is just me walking up to, you know, one of the, one of the, um, fronts of the Old Town Mall and just using the angle to show you, you know, the full sweep of the mall um, or part of the mall. But it really, there's nothing unique about it. There's just nothing. This is just, you know, I call it a snapshot. It's really, or an opening sequence, you know. Um, but on return visits, I was able to start getting a little bit better. Like I love that New Hope Christian Fellowship and I purposely waited and this gentleman just came through the scene. And yes, he might be a little better off, a little more to the left, but I still really like him to the right. He's wearing an Orioles hat. He's wearing Orioles orange. So I'm an Orioles fan. I like that. I like the Roman 837 quote, you know, nay and all these things, we are more than conquerors though, film that loved us. So I started to then narrow my vision down and this is from the outside where you see the sharp dressed man, this used to be covered by a piece of white plastic and although I enjoyed the windows, the white plastic was just really in my way. And one day that I drove by, I noticed that the white plastic was gone. And I saw a sharp dressed man with those two arrows. And then it became, ah, now I've got the shot. Because this is sort of what Old Town Mall has sort of become, um, unfortunately. Hopefully, you know, the city will have some some sechel, as we say in Yiddish, some sense, and they'll raise the entire mall and build lower to middle income housing, because that's what the area desperately, you know, needs. Um, but when I saw that white plastic on, that was my key to say, yes, this was the image that I saw in my head, but I wasn't able to get it before because of that white plastic sheeting that was covering that part of the, of the, uh, of the building. So we're all familiar with Bodine's white marble steps, right? So this is his shot. Um, another way to think about your photography is to preconceive a shot in your head and keep it in your head until you're able to find the vantage point that gives you the shot. So, I was familiar with this shot and I know how the women came out on Saturday mornings and cleaned the marble steps. You know, I've seen those pictures. I know the history of Baltimore, although I'm not from here. And I know that today the steps don't look anything like they used to look. And as I went through my East West Baltimore travels, I always kept my eye out for a more modern version of this shot. And the big problem was, is that a lot of people put railings up 
you know, for safety purposes, because these are steep steps. So a lot of these blocks had, you know, wrought iron railings, and that's not what was in my preconceived image. But one day driving through West Baltimore, I came across this. And this was the image that was in my head. No railings, marble steps in the shape that they're in, dirty, stained, I didn't place any of the props. That's a, a burnt phone book. These liquor bottles were right in the corner. And I have been occasionally criticized for shooting the inequity of Baltimore. The expression that's very popular these days is poverty porn. That's, I don't ascribe to that. I think that's really a horrible attitude to have. Um, Baltimore, like many other urban cities in the Northeast and the Midwest, we do have a tremendous amount of inequality. And as a photographer, I'm out to photograph the world. If I'm only photographing my world, it would be pretty boring. You know, I live a middle class existence. You know, there'd be more pictures of Nico and you've already seen plenty of pictures of Nico. So my job the, my role as a photographer in the city of Baltimore is to show its good points and its bad points. And we have both and it's getting better. I have to say a lot of the shots of abandoned homes that I've taken, they're gone. They're, the abandoned homes have been knocked down and new middle-class housing has been built. So we're making very slow, but sort of steady progress. Here's another example, you know, a block in West Baltimore. I, you know, the, I didn't place the doll there, I, you know, but I drove, I was turning the corner onto this block and the, I, that doll, I caught, you know, it caught my eye. And I just pulled over and got out of the car and got low down. And that gives you that perspective because you can really clearly see all the way to the houses in the back, although she's your major focus, you really then begin to look at the rest of the details, you know, the stop sign and the houses in the background. So again, this is using perspective, but in a more urban kind of, you know, abandoned kind of setting. Um, I could have just taken a picture of her surrounded by the uh, cinder blocks. You know, I probably did do that, as well, but it didn't turn out to be nearly as interesting an image. And I think that has all to do with perspective um, because my perspective on the shot changes your perception of what it looks like. Uh, this is row homes. This is actually near the highway to nowhere that was built and never finished. So this is sort of more on the west side of Baltimore and what I saw as I walked down the, the street was, first of all, these were occupied. Um, but what I really saw was the haphazard nature, but not haphazard nature of the, of the items as they were strewn, the chair, the crutch, the other chair, the items over here. I wanted to get the three chimneys in. I wanted to get the telephone pole in. And this just shows you what some occupied row homes in Baltimore look like from their backyards. Um, you know, we have too many people living in abject poverty in this city. And we as a city need to do a better job of improving the living conditions of our residents. It's just, it's just that simple. We need to improve the education system. We need to improve opportunity. We need to do so many things. This is such a great city but it just needs a lot of work. But photographically, what caught my eye on this was just the rhythm. This image just has, again, really great rhythm that starts with the chair on the right and ends with that little shed on the left. Um, and I purposely toned down the colors. I didn't make it a black and white, but I made it like partially saturated, which helped to emphasize the, um, the tonality and the feeling that I got when I was looking at this building. You know, I, I certainly didn't give me a, a very happy, you know, feeling. So this is a scene that 
I came across where that house right here is occupied. The three next to it though are not, but that's not the scene that I saw in my head. And I needed to figure out again, vantage point wise and digital wise, what did I really want to do with this? Because I think there's a beauty to parts of abandoned Baltimore. And I think it's a beauty that's sort of overlooked. And so that image became this. And this is an HDR preset that I sometimes use um, that also has a topaz effect applied to it. I sometimes use this preset for some of these older abandoned buildings in Baltimore. I purposely left in the context, which is the right and the left, the things that you can see on the right and the left. And what of course stands out is this one occupied building, you know, with a motorcycle that's got, you know, a blue cover over it. Um, and it's so, it's such a contrast, you know, in, 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 in everything. And I also really got to love this tree that was coming out behind it. It just gives it a lot more, you know, atmosphere. So, you know, I went from there to here, you know, and I'm much more pleased with the result, you know, of this than, than the original shot. This is right off in North Avenue. Um, and I pulled down a side street and I looked to my left and I saw this building. And what I really saw though was this graffiti. Someone was very brave because they actually came down this very rickety flight of stairs and were tagging this building as they were coming down. And that really blew my mind. And what also blew my mind was the beautiful wooden architecture of this terrace up here. And I like those two chimneys and I love this tree coming in off the left. And so again, that same HDR preset was used, but I dialed back the strength a little bit because um, I didn't think it needed quite as much as the previous one. But this is what Baltimore has to offer. Um, if you're, if that's, if this is what you're trying to, you know, trying to capture. Um, and this was one of my earlier shots. And what drew me to this scene first was this cross on the building. I just, that just, as I drove down this block, I saw that cross. And again, this building is abandoned, but these next two are occupied. And then I noticed if right across the street, I'm not sure if it's Green Mount or Baltimore. I think that's Baltimore Cemetery right across the street. And then I noticed this beautiful tree and then I noticed this beautiful leading line leading you right to the tree. And so this tree balances out the buildings on this side. And so by putting these elements together, I think I called this from the cradle to the grave. Um, it really created a really nice balanced composition. You know, if I just shot the houses, it would have just been a shot of the houses. If I just shot the tree with some stones, that's what it would have been. But by combining the two, I'm trying to put the best of both worlds sort of together um, into one image, uh, which sort of holds together. Uh, Lewis? Yep. Hi, Sandy. I just want you to know that it's about 9 uh, um, 35. And okay. I know people are going to want to ask questions. So just don't okay. want to bring. Bring that uh, to your attention. Okay. Good. I'll buzz through the rest of this rather quickly. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I criticize people for taking other people's art, but this is on the, this is on the side of a building in Hamden that is absolutely impossible to get to. I had to stop my car on the JFX and take it with a long lens because there's no there's no room between the building and the actual waterway. And I just thought the graffiti on this building with the stairway coming down through it was just really cool. So, you know, yeah, I did photograph someone else's art or a lot of people's art, but I really enjoyed this picture. I still do. And here's the other side of Baltimore, right? This is a beautiful row of homes in Hamden. And one of them happens to belong to Karen Kleindeest, who's a great artist, a great photographer. And we're going to do a print exchange. I'm going to get one of hers and I'm going to give her one of these. And um, it's a great way to meet people. 
Um, I think I've showed you guys macros, you know, macros can be straight on macros or they can be abstract. So don't, on, don't only look at them as straight on macros, but also look at them in abstract ways. Uh, these are some interesting darker images that I made actually as I was recovering from cancer, which one of our members noted, um, which I didn't even pick up on the fact that for a period of time, my images got a little bit darker. Um, here's a great example. I'm gonna go quickly go through people and then we're done. Here's a great example. This is a, a young Jewish, Orthodox Jewish boy at a, at a, a ritual burning that's taking place on one of the parking lots of Pimlico Racetrack. And I saw him and I captured this image. And to say it's not complimentary is to just put it mildly. Um, but by sticking with your subject, you know, I then was able to get this. And this was what I was looking for. Um, because now I've got him in a really pensive pose. His gray matches the gray of the fence, low aperture, totally blurred out the background. Um, and he's watching the rabbis say prayers over the burning of uh, basically it's food products before Passover. So, you know, I love shooting candid shots. I love going to Artscape. I don't ask people permission. I'm usually shooting with longer lenses and just waiting um, to get, you know, uh, a good face. I love this young boy trying to deal with this big piece of pizza. This was a good shot of the, of the diversity of Baltimore, all the ethnicities. They're watching some acrobats um, uh, perform at Artscape. This guy saw me with my camera and held his baby up really proud and gave me a big smile. And there's a, I love that guy in the background with the shades on. You know, but again, this is a real straightforward style. Um, it's just doing candid street photography. I love this guy. He was just jiving. There was a reggae band playing on one of the stages and he was just having a grand old time. Um, so I really zoomed in close and got, you know, got his dreads and got his hat and got, you know, a really good scene. Um, I, walking back to my car one day from Artscape, I saw these three people sitting on a stoop and I was like, oh, I got to take a picture of this. Look at these guys. They're all having a great time. They're eating the wonderful food that Artscape has to offer. And look at the triangle that they form. It's just, you know, it's just a natural composition. Uh, this was a young girl sitting on the hill at Artscape, um, you know, and when I'm doing candid street work, I'm scanning the crowd with my camera, and I came across her, but I wasn't crazy with the right-hand side of the image, um, and so I just cropped it, and I darkened it down, and I think now your attention is drawn much more to her, um, and, you know, what she's thinking, I haven't the slightest idea, but I love pictures that make you think, well, what is that person really thinking about? And I've, I've really missed Artscape. These two guys are just having a great time. So, you know, to me, it was just like a natural. It was just like, I got to get these two guys. Um, this was uh, the Latino Festival, Day of the Dead. And this young boy, he did see me with my camera and he gave me those eyes. And it was just like, thank you very much. And, you know, I just love this picture. Um, you know, what he's thinking, I don't know. Um, but, you know, he definitely saw me with my camera, definitely shot his eyes at me. And that's when I hit the shutter and pop, I got this shot. And I like doing them this way too, sometimes really close cropping. Um, I was standing behind the booth when these three young Latino girls walked up. That's their grandma with the big cross behind them. And I think she's a really important part of the image. But they also saw me with my camera and my lens. And they all sort of looked up at me. And right at the moment that they looked up at me, pop, I took the shot. And I just, they were all wearing Hello Kitty hats, which I just thought was just, just dynamite. I just liked her. I liked Little Italy. It wasn't Little Italy Baltimore. It was Little Italy, I think, from Sarasota, Florida. But I just liked her expression and just, you know, her hair was kind of cool. And I liked her smirk. So, you know, I, I, I grabbed a shot of her. 
Uh, this was at the end of, we have a parade in Mount Washington. We hopefully will resume that again on the July 4th. Uh, we have a little bagpiper and, you know, we do a little parade. And this was at the end of a parade. And uh, this was during our tough political times during a couple of years ago. And uh, I just called this one a sad state of affairs because, you know, her face is all made up and she's wearing that stuff, but her face is telling me something completely different. And um, um, I just really, it was a good grab shot. It was just, I just turned at the right moment and I just got her right at the right spot. Um, perspective, you know, we went to mud sales to, so that we can shoot the Amish. This is one where the perspective is not correct because I'm really not getting a good enough shot. This is another one where it's not really good enough, you know, but these, are even though she's looking to the side i like the smile i like the amish hat in the background and then these are straight on where they saw me with my camera and just gave me whatever look they wanted to give me this particular next one was not too pleased but i still love the shot i love him holding the handle of the wagon And this guy also saw me. So I got a really nice small little smile in his eyes. Um, and they all did what well, they looked so much better in black and white. Now, when you take a picture, you never know how important it is going to be in your life. This is a very important picture to me. I took this picture in Remington near where Kathleen Hill lives, probably about seven or eight years ago. So the first thing, and the first reason why this image became so important to me was because I had, I caught, I got lymphoma and I had cancer. And so if you guys remember, every time I posted a health update, this was the image that I posted, still alive. It was, I'm still here, you know, I'm kicking. I'm going through chemo, I feel like shit, but I'm still here. Then COVID came and this issue, this image became even more important. So you never know when you take an image, how long its lifespan is gonna be and how important it's gonna be to you as you live your lifespan. And this is my ending image. I'm waiting online to get some ice cream and I'm looking at the gentleman in front of me who's all tattooed and I see this, there is always hope on his tattooed on his arm. And I said, oh, wow, what a great message and what a great shot to take. And I just captured just his arm, you know, with that, with that image. Um, and with that, that is the end of my presentation. So I will stop share. And well, what I hope I showed you was that you don't have to develop a style of photography. You just have to realize the things that you enjoy photographing them, photographing and building up that emotional connection to those particular things and your images will raise in quality they will be more interesting to your to your viewers so thank you again for your attention i'm sorry if i went a little long um but it gave you a really good cross section of a really wide variety of my style of photography which isn't one style it's lots of different styles depending on what i'm shooting so that was really one of my goals in creating this uh, program. Well, thank you very much. I um, did have a few of the aha moments. Good. Um, yeah, particularly because you have always um, advised me to wait, sit and yeah. wait. And then I saw the value <laughs> of that in your image of the woman on uh, the vessel uh, yeah. looking out. So thank you. Yeah. I, had, I had a few. Yep. So Patient. questions, you guys, yep. I... questions, comments, anything, by the way, um, Sandy is going to pass around tomorrow a survey that I like to do through survey monkey. It's only five questions and a place for comments. So please do take a couple of minutes and fill it out because 
I do take comments that I get. It's all anonymous, but I do take the comments and the feedback that I get seriously. I make changes to my programs based on the comments. So um, it is very important to me to get feedback, especially via Zoom. It's sort of like strange. <laughs> So okay. Sandy, I have a whole bunch of entries in there, but I, I know, just want to boil it. We don't have to go all of them. A lot of it was just commentary. I was very vociferous in the chatting today. But the one that I wanted to talk about was it was just very interesting to me. You keep saying that you don't have a style. Right. And yet I kept hearing two words, humanity mm -hmm. and rhythm. OK. Yeah. So is it in every single type of photo that you were doing? Do you, do you want to comment on that? Is that your actual style? You always bring well, humanity and rhythm to every image. Well, I mean, again, you know, it's like, um, as I said earlier, you know, when an image really works, it's basically a, co a combination of a variety of those building blocks. So, you know, humanity, yeah, I like to bring humanity to everything I do, not just in photography, but, you know, with my friends and my daughter and her family and my wife and my pet. And, you know, so that's just me. I, you know, that's just me. I don't necessarily think of rhythm as a style. I think of rhythm as a necessary ingredient of a lot of images because they add to the interest of the image. So um, I would just differ with you a little bit, you know, because I think things like perspective and rhythm are really important to creating really interesting images. Um, and, you know, rhythm especially is kind of overlooked, I think, when you listen to other speakers, it doesn't really come up real often. But I really remember that conversation that I had with Tony Sweet, and that must have been 12, 13, 14 years ago. And he described the way he looks at compositions as he's like he was still drumming on his drummer, like on his drum kit. And it was like, wow, I never really kind of thought of it that way, you know, but that's how he sort of looks at the different elements of his of what he's seeing in his viewfinder. And it really kind of opened my eyes to looking for that more often. So I have to consider can continue this uh, philosophical discussion at Jerry's <laughs> when it opens again, or we can go there a bit later, but anyways. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Any other comments? What did people think? Well, I think rhythm is so closely attached to sound that yeah. it is a good word because it makes you, it makes you try to match it to the, to the visual so yeah. which is it which is an interesting rather than just say pattern because pattern is sort of a static yeah yeah and rhythm is more abstract because you yeah. kind of have to think yeah pa pattern i i look at pattern as static whereas mm -hmm. i look at rhythm as movement yeah that's a good idea yeah, i think i'll, I'll definitely keep that in mind um, <clears throat> and we're attracted as humans to both mm -hmm. we love patterns and we love you know most people love things you know, re repetition is a kind of rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so when you take a beginning photography class, they, they stress, it's always good to have repeating items. Well, what they're really saying is it's a good way to bring rhythm into your pictures is to have repetitive items in, in them. So I think it's very, it's kind of similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you think of sound, it'll probably guide, it'll probably guide you when you're trying to compose the photo. <clears throat> yeah. Now, you know, um, Arthur once, he said to me recently that the music that you listen to while you're working on your post-processing may have an influence. Now that I had to really think about, and I'm still thinking about that because I, I, I haven't completely bought into that yet because I don't really see, because I've tried different musics while I work on different images and I don't really see the impact that it's having but sometimes those things just need more thought you know you just need, you know like it was a thought that got placed in my brain that i need to sort of work through a little bit yeah that can be a body of work right so you could try sure. and create one image for every like song so 
Yeah. ACDC I mean, Thunderstruck or something. What what image would you I <laughs> take mean, for that or something? <laughs> I, I will say that I tend to do my best work when I'm out by myself, although I love going out with my friends when we do it as a, you know, a group trip or a, or a weekend trip. And you know, then I'm almost always listening to music of some sort while I'm you know, driving and while I'm taking pictures. So maybe there is that connection there. So I don't know. Yeah, that's something that really, you know, that was a thought that got planted that I just need to think a little more about. So. Yeah. Sam had a question. Sure. Well, Sam, you need to turn on your audio. <clears throat> that's better, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So you started off talking about um, showing three dimensions. And right. You had the railroad lines and all of that. Right. But then this guy, Aaron Siskin, talked about just it's a two dimensional piece of paper, your print. Yep. And so forget about depth and just do two dimensions. So what do you think of that? I just don't agree with that. I just, I think there are certain images, like when I shot the wall of graffiti, I mm -hmm, mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to try and bring perspective into that because I'm shooting a wall. Um, when I shot the windows at Crown Court Conceal, you know, that's pure 2D. I personally really like images where the depth and the perception, it, you know, changes my perception of the image. Um, He's a, he, but he's a very well-known and famous photographer. So I'm not, you know, I, I'm, you know, it's like saying something bad about, you know, Ansel Adams or Gary Winogrand. I mean, you know, uh, he definitely made it in the world of photography, but, you know, everybody has their own way of approaching, you know, their art, um, mm -hmm. which is why when we go out as a group to the same location, we come back with completely different images because we all see differently you know we may you know five of us may walk around a farm where the hat you know where there's some barns and some stuff and none of us come back with images that look very close to each other and that's because everyone approaches what they want to shoot from their personal point of view so um you know it's just that's just you know it's a, it's a that's tough that's a tough one for me to comment on Okay. Tina. What, Diane? Tina has oh. a question she put oh. in the chat. Oh, yeah, oh. put it in the chat. Yeah. Oh, what oh. was it? Let me go back. What was my question? Oh, I said, when you go out to take photos, do you have an idea of what you will shoot or you just shoot with an open mind? I, yeah, yeah. But I do both. Um, I would say that in general, when you go out, if you have a better idea of what you're trying to accomplish that on that shoot, it's a better way of reaching your goal of creating um, more intricate and more interesting images. Okay. That does not mean that at times I'm just wandering around and all of a sudden something strikes me and it's like, wow, that's really cool. But I love, I always give my students, you know, projects because I think giving yourself and giving, and me as a teacher, giving people projects, it helps them, especially in the beginning stages, and it's a bad pun, but it helps them focus on a, a specific topic of interest to them. Okay. You know, I don't assign topics. I say to them, what do you, what are you naturally attracted to? Well, I like cemeteries. Okay, well, what do you like about cemeteries? Well, I like the stones. I said, okay, well, then that's what you should be shooting. So spend a month and don't do anything but shoot stones and cemeteries because that's how you'll get even more connected to them. And so that's the way that I assign, you know, projects to my students is basically to ask them to ask themselves what is of interest to them that they want to pursue photographically and then to pursue it and um you know a lot of times it really helps especially people in the beginning stages because 
people in the beginning stages, the biggest mistake they make is their images are far too complicated. There's much too much in the frame. I, I don't know what to look at, you know? And I think, I think you saw through my imagery, old and new, that what came up on the screen was exactly what I wanted you to look at. There wasn't very little extraneous material included because that extraneous material is a distraction to your viewer. There, that confuses them. And the less confusion you create, the more time your viewers will spend on your imagery. Um, and I feel very strongly about that. So whether it's the acronym KISS, keep it simple, stupid, or just a mindful exercise that you do. Um, so to answer you, Tina's question, I don't always have a goal, but I definitely have those concepts that have now ingrained in my brain that this is the way I'm going to come back with photos that I'll be happier with. That doesn't mean that I don't come back from places and, and really am unhappy with my work because it happens all the time. Right. You know, it just didn't work that day. It just didn't, something just didn't happen. It doesn't gel. Um, but, you know, a lot of times if you have a preconceived notion, I think that kind of helps guide you that on that particular shoot. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of how I feel. And that's how I teach because I think it's a very helpful teaching tool. Okay, thank you. So, okay. Louis, I just want you to know, I don't know whether you can see it or not, but the chat room is full of, thank you, oh, incredible uh, images, yes. inspiring. If there's anybody I enjoy talking to, it's you guys. I miss all you guys that I haven't seen. I saw some of you at print night, which was great. I hope to see more when we do print night again in March. Hopefully this is kind of finally ebb. Jerry's is coming back, I've been told. I spoke to the, uh, the liquor store guy and he said they just got the permits. They're gonna start the renovation soon. So hopefully within a, you know, a finite amount of time, we will be able to get back to where we once were. My health is great. I'm cancer free, I'm fine. And so uh, I've got more to celebrate than, than than not. So, um, you know, and this just continues to just be a passion of mine. I just, just, you know, and it's all due to you guys. A lot of it's due to you guys because, um, you know, living in Southern New York County rekindled my interest in photography because I love it. It's beautiful up there. It's gorgeous. But meeting the people at the club and seeing the work of Steve Oney and Gary and Gordon and the early members that I first met, it was like, wow. You know, I'm shooting color slides of barns and they're like blowing my mind with really beautiful imagery. And that's really what inspired me to become a better photographer. Um, and that's what led me to then say, well, you know, I might as well start to teach photography if I'm going to take it this, you know, seriously. So, and I always get great feedback as a teacher. So that's, that, that keeps me, you know, that keeps me in the loop um, uh, as teaching. So, well, you are. No, I show. Uh, oh, uh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, you always show us your humanity. <laughs> uh, I, thank you very much. That's a very, very kind thing um, to say. And my wife wouldn't agree with that 100% of the time. <laughs> uh, but I will pass along the comments. <laughs> go ahead, Sandy. Sorry well, to I was just, uh, What I was just going to say is that you were inspired by others. Yes. And now you are inspiring others. Yes. So it is passing it along. Passing forward. Yeah. 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 Yep. So yep. thank you. No problem. No problem. Yeah. And thank uh, you. Yes, Ola. <laughs> I know it's our okay. path. I know our paths will cross again in the future. I can't say that to the other clubs that I've been talking to, but I, I can say for a fact that our paths will be crossing again in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> yes good i look forward to it all, all right. right thank you everybody for joining us it's Enjoy a great night night, guys and everybody yeah. be well yeah bye Take don't care. forget you recorded sandy there you go i i did record it thank you <laughs> bye bye bye